after lunch slot. Oh my God, always the hard one. And I understand that you had Alain de Botton earlier philosophizing, for, which is always very engaging. I mean, I love to philosophize, but I don't quite get the luxury that he has, because his entire job seems to be philosophizing, uh, which is wonderful. But it is an interesting time to be philosophizing, uh, because there are a lot of things that are changing and that we have to think about, I think, in much more profound ways. And many of you will have heard me talk about this being one of the most important and interesting times there's ever been to be in HR. And sometimes I extend that thought to business as well. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, as it says on the title here, um, some of the trends that are driving HR as a profession and as a, as a set of capabilities, if you will, and some of our conclusions about, you know, kind of what do we need to do next. And I think you will find echoes of a lot of what I say in things you've already heard this morning, and I know from Richard coming on after me and Alan a bit later on in the afternoon. So uh, I'm going to provide a few segues as well. Um, so what are the, some of the big trends? I mean, you could look at 101 different things, but I always love to start with this one. The uncertainty of the economy. We thought that we were doing really well, all the Conservative Party thought we were doing really well with our economic growth until they announced the fact that our economic growth in the last quarter halved from 0.6 to 0.3%. Um, we're still talking about Grexits. Did you know that Poland is about to issue negative interest rates on their government bonds? Poland, right? Uh, China's been slowing. We talk about Grexits and all these other things. So the point of all of this is that the nature of the economy, the nature of the world that we live in has never been more uncertain and more changeable. And it doesn't matter who tells you what. You could talk to any number of economists and you get 15 different views. That is the reality. And one of the things, of course, that is driving is a real need for agility and adaptability and resilience. And those have become the real watchwords of business everywhere as I see it. So you got all of that, and so we could spend ages talking about that and the nature of work and the jobs that we do. We got this. Here's another acronym for you. That first acronym on that first one is often VUCA. We live in a VUCA world, right? Volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Here's another one for you. Powered by smack. <laughs> if you're laughing, it means you have an un another understanding of that phrase, which is a bit worrying. Smack, yes. Yeah, so social, so it's all the digital technology stuff. So social, mobile, analytics, and cloud. And this technology stuff is impacting every kind of business, it's impacting how we work, where we work, the work we do. Uh, a lot of people, I read an interesting survey not long ago that suggested that almost two-thirds of the jobs that young people who are in school today will do have not yet been invented. That's quite a sobering thought, isn't it? So what's education for? I mean, certainly the idea that education is there to provide oven-ready employees, if that's what we believe, that all the skills we need in the world of work, that paradigm is long gone. And it reinforces the idea that we have to be able to upskill and reskill all the time. But this is impacting everything that we do. Um, and then the final one, I think, is around workforce and demographics. You know, all the changes to the nature of the workforce and all this debate about what Gen Y wants or what Gen Z wants and how they think differently, and I think you had some more input on that subject this morning as well. Um, but it's not just about the young generation. It's about the older generations as well. It's about the aging workforce that we have in many places. Um, I've just come back from the Middle East, and the Middle East has a dramatically different demographic profile than Western Europe, where we have an aging population. You've got countries like Japan, where they now have, they are the first developed nation on earth to see their population actually start to decline. Because they, are not, they have not been having enough children for decades now, and their aging population is doing just that. It's aging. So that is a really important dimension, of course, for us to understand. And, and to give you a feel for how some of this is shaping uh, what is happening, I, I've got a few interesting stats here um, about the nature of the workforce and the work that we do just in the UK. So we now have 15% of total employment is self-employed. That is the highest level it has ever been. You can see the charts here. Full-time employment has just gone beyond where it was at the beginning of the, here's another acronym. You know what the GFC is, don't you? The Global Financial Crisis. I love acronyms. Anyway, um, so 15% are self-employed. 90% of the increase is in the 50-plus segment. So, of course, it's right that we focus on young people coming into work, but interestingly, we've got a lot of people seeking to return to work and wanting to work longer. And that is, some of it's basic economics, they can't all afford to retire, 
but also it's a demographic and a generational shift about how we reposition the thinking of what retirement really is. And it's not a one-time event. I worked full-time till Friday, and then I stopped on Monday and did the gardening for the next 20 years. That is not typically now, I think, how our generation is starting to think about retirement. High-skilled jobs account for 71% of the employment rise. Um, and a 10% decline in average earnings in real terms since the beginning of the global financial crisis. And then look where all the jobs are. The jobs are happening in small businesses and small enterprises. So these are real trends in the nature of work, you know, driven by the things I've already said, but I just found some of those really extraordinary, like high-skilled jobs accounting for 71% of the employment rise. And then, of course, you look at how do we make all this work, and we've got lots of people doing relatively low-skilled jobs, often un uh, uh, to, uh, uh, underemployed for the skills they've got, and then we can't fill the high-skilled jobs. So one of the big impacts of this is the debate about productivity. Productivity. Really, really important, because as a nation, we are not, you know, we're not tracking with the rest of the world in terms of productivity growth. Um, I don't know if you saw Robert Peston on the uh, News at 10 last night. He always amuses me. His hair seems to be getting longer and longer, doesn't it? Really? <laughs> but anyway, <coughs> that wasn't what really amused me about it. It's just his style. So as he was talking about whatever it was, I think, you know, I can't remember which party's manifest it was. But as he walked off camera, he said, and of course, the thing we've, he, to nobody in particular, not even to the camera, but of course, the thing we've really got to fix is productivity. And he's right. I mean, and this is at the heart of our role, I believe, as HR. And, and I'm sure <coughs> we'll talk more about you know, some of the analytics, but one of the most important things is to understand the productivity of a workforce. You know, are these, have they got the right skills? Are they in the right place? Are they doing the right jobs that are meaningful? Are they able to be more productive? And that's not just a purely an economic argument. It's also, I think, what's uh, good for the workforce and good for organizations as a whole. But our national productivity has been declining on a competitive basis with other nations. And we can't keep going on like that. And that is one of the reasons why average earnings is not increasing. So it's a very profound issue driven by these bigger trends. So what does that mean for HR? Well, <clears throat> that is why I, I say it's such an important and exciting time to be in HR. But we still have some challenges. I mean, look at this Anthony Hilton. I don't know if you saw that article in The Standard. I mean, if you doubted whether we're in an interesting place, look at that headline. HR must up their act if the UK is to succeed, which is going right back to what I've already said. We need to make sure that we're making the best of our people and the assets and capabilities of our workforce. But we're not always in the right place. I mean, the Ram Charan article, is it time to split our HR, i.e. HR is good at the transactional and administrative stuff, but we need somebody else to do the strategic stuff. Is that what we want to do? I don't think so. Certainly not what I want to do. Um, and then, you know, and this is a KPMG survey, um, so HR is much to prove 34% of CEOs feel that HR is well prepared for the challenges ahead, which says two-thirds don't think they are. So this is our challenge. This is the time for us to step up, is the point of all of that. Um, so it is an inflection point, and uh, you know, I love this, people are your most important assets. I am not convinced that that rhetoric, which we've heard for years from business leaders, has actually been understood or delivered on. I just don't think it has, and now we've really got to understand what that all means. Um, and it does mean all of these sorts of things. It means all of these sorts of things. Um, you know, how we get a clearer voice from our people, how we hear from them. Uh, and that, of course, is hugely important, particularly to the younger generation. They are absolutely determined to have a voice. Uh, I remember from, uh, I used to work at Accenture, and I remember the chief executive always telling me he got what he called more love notes, i.e. emails, from the younger generation coming into the organization to tell him how to run the business than anybody else. Right? So they want a voice, and it is right that our people should have a voice. They're the ones doing the work. They should have the ideas and inputs and thoughts about how we improve some of this stuff. Recognition, empowerment, happiness. Happiness is a legitimate business subject. It's a legitimate business subject. Wasn't always so, which is back to my point about people are our most important assets. Why, if our people are our most important assets, why wouldn't happiness be a legitimate business subject? But the rhetoric historically was from many business leaders, I don't pay people to come here to be happy, I pay them to come here to work. And if they didn't say it, a lot of them thought it. Um, we talk about national happiness. You all know which is the happiness, happiest country in the world, don't you? And it's not the Scandinavian countries, it's Bhutan, apparently. Um, Bhutan. Now, that just illustrates one very important point, is that happiness is not just about income and financial well-being and all those other things. Although, actually, financial well-being is a very important component at the lower end of the wage spectrum for well-being. 
Um, so happiness um, and uh, you know, well-being, which I, I've, I've touched on, such an important theme for us. Um, our latest surveys from the CIPD have, have now shown that stress is the biggest source of absenteeism work today. One in four of us are either suffering or will suffer mental health issues, measurable mental health issues during our working lives, and it's getting worse. There is an endemic of stress in the workplace. And if you're stressed and we're not looking after well-being, we're not coaching our managers as to how to understand that, and we're not providing the support to our people, then how can we ha expect them to be happy and engaged and productive and prosperous and all those other things? So very, very important uh, uh, debates here. And I know that Alan, is, Alan Watkins is going to talk more about the emotional side of work. And this is really what we're saying, rethinking the work working relationship. It is about these things as much as it is about you know, what job am I doing and what skills have I got. It's how do I connect, how do I engage, how do I emotionally engage, am I secure in terms of my own well-being, uh, and all these other things, and shared values, and of course, trust, which is a whole topic all by itself. Trust is pretty broken. It's pretty broken. You look at all the Edelman trust barometers and all these other things, there's a real issue of trust. There's issue of trust in large enterprise, in business, in politicians, in media, in sport. And a younger generation who comes in again into the world of work with a higher expectation of how we're all going to behave. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. So very, very important things here. Now, having said all of that, and I've touched on it already, at the heart of so much of this is this guy. This guy. The line manager. The line manager. Because it is the line managers. It's the first line supervisors. They're the ones managing the majority of the workforce. And HR has got to enable and support these guys better. In a world with all of the changes that we've been describing, and the expectation now that managers will understand the things I just put on the first slide because they so significantly impact it, they're the ones that have the biggest impact on things like engagement. Uh, so how do we do a better job of training them and enabling them and supporting them? And why shouldn't we all walk around with a badge on our back that says, how's my managing? because we need to feed that back and we need to see it as part of their performance. Their performance is not just what technically they accomplished or what sales they delivered, it's how did they do it and did they look after their people properly. And all of the, all of the surveys on leadership and everything else now are pointing to the reality that people evaluate their managers and leaders on fundamentally things like trust and benevolence, which is the idea that, I, that my manager actually cares for me and gives a damn. And we're not always measuring those things. And I think historically, in my experience, and you know, I'm, I'm sure there's some people who do, do it well, but we have not done enough of this stuff. We really do need to train and support these people. And, and, and one final thought on this, when I talked about emotional well-being and mental stress being the biggest source of a challenge at work, my goodness, that is a tough one to deal with. And we've got to train managers to have the kind of conversations which helps them understand what they've got to do to support people. So, very, very important uh, agenda for us. And then, you know, so to, bring, to start to bring that into, so are we doing the right things in HR? What else have we got to think about? So first of all, you know, are we doing all these things effectively? Are we sourcing in the right ways? Are we thinking about our future talent and then aligning our recruitment channels to those different sources of talent? It's not a one-size-fits-all. Are we thinking about different ways in which we can get, engage talent that doesn't always have to be about full-time employment? or part-time employment, crowdsourcing, all these other ways in which people engage. And particularly when you go to workforce, as I've already pointed out, that 15% of the workforce now is self-employed. That trend, as best we can tell, is likely to, to continue. So our ability to attract and connect to skills and talent, particularly the scarcer skills and talent, are going to be very dependent on our ability to think differently about how we recruit and actually what our workforce really is. Um, and all the way through how we develop people, reward, progress, and so on. So that's the kind of classic heartland of HR. But the other part of HR, which is so important, is are we really thinking about all this stuff? Are we designing jobs and roles which are meaningful? Are we building meaningful organizations? Do we understand the culture? And this debate is really, I think, central now to so much of the debate about what's got to change in business. What has got to change in business? How do we become more responsible as business? How do we rebuild trust? How do we make sure that people are behaving in the right way? And it's all this debate about culture, including, and I'm sure some people here work in financial services, particularly in areas like financial services. And guess what? And I'm going to uh, talk about this in a second a bit more. You can't change behaviors by writing more rules. 
So we've got to think about this stuff very, very differently. And I think this is the sort of area where we need to contribute more. And, and simple things like job design. I mean, we talk about, I, I mentioned SMAC and technology and how much that's impacting jobs and roles. There are lots of surveys, again, that will point to the fact that the impact on jobs is not where the old industrial revolution stuff was, which is down in the low-skilled jobs. It's increasing mid- to high-skilled jobs. And we need to design the jobs that are meaningful. There's a great danger that technology, and I've seen many examples of this, will take us, if we don't design meaningful jobs and roles around the technology, then we could end up in a place of scientific management, you know, back to meaningless jobs. We have such a responsibility to design meaningful jobs, meaningful roles, which contribute to the overall business outcome and business benefit. So <clears throat> that, I think, is an area we need to grow more on. And then a couple of other big themes that have got to support all of this. The first is analytics, and I'm not going to you know, overdo this one because we've got Robert coming on in a second, um, but this is such an important agenda for us. You know, I, I, one of my favorite quotes was a, a senior business leader said to me not long ago, he said, the trouble with HR is it brings too much PowerPoint and not enough Excel. It's a very simple way of understanding the issue, right? Um, and you know, here's a whole bunch of PowerPoint, I know. But anyway, so, and, and this little chart here on the right just shows part of our challenge. You know, it is tough. When, when we talk about big data, there are these extraordinary stats about how much data is growing and by how much. Absolutely extraordinary. It's for, so the velocity, how much more data is being added all the time, it's variety. And then for us, it's veracity, i.e., is this data any damn good? And why does it all contradict itself when we look at different sources of data? So this is challenging stuff, but it is vital that we progress this agenda. And so we're working very hard on it in terms of, okay, so we can keep saying we need to do something on it, but what is it that we should do? How do we get to a better place where we've got more common understanding of what are the good metrics? What are the different ways to measure these things? What are the good you know, uh, uh, benchmarks that we can use and so forth in the context of the business that we're in? So we've got this program running now uh, with a variety of other groups. So we're working with the finance community on this as well because this is not just an HR issue. This is fundamentally a business issue. And the reason it's a business issue is because this is where the value comes from. Back to my point about people are our most important assets and we didn't really understand it. Well, the economists understand this much better, the finance community understands this much better, the investor community is starting to understand this stuff much better, that the real value of a business comes from its people. How they're engaged, how they work together with a common objective and a common purpose, uh, whether the cultures are right, whether the leadership's capable. Those are the things that drive value. And you think, well, hallelujah, right? But we, as I say, we need to work together, therefore, with the finance profession and, and investor community, governments and others to say, it's about time that we started to say what it is that we can do and how we get to more common standards. And again, one of my favorite examples to illustrate the challenge that we have is headcount. Nice simple thing, right? What's our headcount? How many times have you disagreed with your finance team as to what the headcount is? And how many times have you sat in front of a business leader and you both disagreed, and then who does the, who does the business leader believe? HR or finance? Finance, typically. Well, how crazy is that, right? We need to have a common language. It's what I describe as, you know, we, we've berated ourselves over the years as saying HR doesn't speak the language of business. Well, we don't have a common business language of HR. If we haven't got a common definition of some of these terms and better frameworks and structures to help us understand these things, then we are not in a good place. And that's what this initiative of Valuing Your Talent's about. And it is quite extraordinary, as I said, the level of interest and importance this now has. In the context I just described, this becomes so much more important. And this is what we mean when we say people are our most important, well, this is what an economist would mean, when people are our most important assets. All right, well, then how do I measure them? What have I got to look at? What's important? Okay? So that's, we're going to hear more about that, but really important points. And then this final quote here, but not everything that is counted counts. And not everything that counts is counted. Do you know who said that? Great quote machine, Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein said that, and it's so true in our world. Just because we can count some of these things does not make them the right things to count. And a good example of that would be recruitment cost. Cost of recruitment, right? So people say, well, I need to make sure, and it's a classic efficiency debate for HR, Make sure we're efficient. Reduce my cost of recruitment. Is that important, or is it more important that I recruit the right people? 
And if recruiting the right people means I've got to spend more time, as I should be, understanding behaviors and attitudes and cultural alignment and fit and all those other ideas, potential aspirations, if that's what's really important in terms of driving value from the people, then shouldn't we be measuring that, which is harder to measure than the easy to measure metric of, of cost of recruitment? And, uh, and it's particularly important, that kind of debate, to shift the discussion from a discussion which has been so long in the world of HR about efficiency. And we're all obsessed about Ulrich models and things like that. Yet what we are driving in terms of value is so immense. And you know that the cost of HR in a business is typically between 1% and 2% of the cost of the business. And yet in most businesses, we are influencing two-thirds or more of the cost just by looking at the total loaded cost of payroll. Nothing else, right? So that's what this debate is about. Really, really important. And so you're going to hear more from Robert. Um, and then you got this one, which is, and I've touched on it already. I said, OK, if the essence of what we've got to understand better, and the very heart of what HR is about, it's about understanding people, about what they do, how they learn, why they do the things they do, how they behave, how they make the decisions they make, and how that fits in terms of an organization. Why do people work differently in an organization than they might think uh, outside of an organization? Why do they, what's going on? And that's the heart of the profession. That's what we do. And yet, so many of the par paradigms and heuristics we've used are pretty ancient. If I asked you for, give me a good motivational model, I'm sure a few hands would go up and tell me about Maslow. Do you know when Maslow wrote his hierarchy of needs? 1943. Long time ago, right? So we, we, and, and all this stuff like neuroscience, and again, I know Alan, Alan's going to talk some of these things, really informing some different understanding and thinking about how the brain works, how we respond to stress, how we learn, what makes us happy, what makes us engaged, those sorts of things. Positive psychology, which I love because it amuses me, you have to put positive in front of psychology to remind us that so much psychology historically is based on a negative paradigm. And we have used many of those negative paradigms in the world of work. Another favorite of mine, the change curve. You all know the change curve. I mean, you know where that came from. Bereavement counseling. We have equated change in organizations to the worst possible life experience, which is bereavement. Why? I plead guilty to charge. I plead guilty to charge that. I mean, I, you know, as, as a consultant, who's going to sell change management things to organisations, say, for a sufficiently large number of fees, we could reduce the depth and duration of your change curve. I think it's profoundly wrong. It's profoundly the wrong paradigm, and all this stuff tells you it is. And positive psychology is about the study. You know, another way it's described: the study of happiness. And that people are much more motivated, motivated and engaged and all these other things if you focus on the positive. But other examples I'll give you is when we talk about performance management, what have we typically said to the managers they need to do? You've got to be prepared for the tough conversation. You've got to deliver all the tough messages. Well, what about delivering the positive messages? Look at all the science. It'll tell you that is way more effective in terms of changing people's behaviors and all these other things. So really important stuff there. Behavioral economics. Read Tipping Point and Nudge, and, and one of my favorite books I've read recently, um, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. Really recommend that book. Daniel Kahneman is a, pri a Nobel Prize winning an e economist, but he's a psychologist by training, and he's reminding us of all the things we've known about why do people do the things they do. The study of economics, as most people will tell you, is understanding why people make the decisions they do or how people respond to incentives. And isn't that our world? Isn't that what we're trying to understand? And we need to embrace some of that stuff because honestly, if we want to understand how to affect large-scale change, then we need to look at that field of science, behavioral economics, way more, frankly, than our old paradigms of change, as I said. So read things like Daniel Kahn. It's so interesting. And it frames up some of these other, and systems thinking is a, a sort of wider, how do we connect lots of different ideas together, and then this debate about values and ethics. And I'm going to show you one more slide on this on the values and ethics things, because I think it's so important. So this whole point about behavioral economics, why do people do the things they do? Why is it that people outside an organization would never do anything to harm their next door neighbor who happens to be a retired old lady, and yet they can go to work and flog them some financial product that wipes out their life savings? Why does that happen? Why does it happen? And it's because of these sorts of things, particularly this, that the world of work, I already said that you can't change behaviors by writing more rules. We all know that, don't we? We've, all, we've always known that. That research has been there forever. What do we often like doing in HR? We like writing rules. We like policies, right? We like policies. Um, this idea here is, is a very simple construct, and it says, 
if you give people more rules, you put them into a small box, and, it, and basically you're, it's a parent-child relationship. It's saying, here are the rules, all you've got to do is adhere to the rules. That is a parent-child relationship, or what Roger Steer calls the ethics of obedience. Cor he calls himself the corporate philosopher. He's a bit like Alan, spends a lot of time in the bath thinking about stuff. Um, <clears throat> ethics of care is that, okay, it's not just about the rules, I actually have a duty of care to other people. Now, guess what? Women are better at this than men. And then you get to the ethics of reason, which is, okay, I intellectually understand why I would be doing these things, and that's what drives my decision-making process. So when we write, write more rules, what we're doing is forcing people into that box, into that box. And there are so many examples. This. One of my favorites is uh, a social engineering experiment in the Dutch town of Drachten. Have you heard about this one? Well, they took away all the road, road signs, the, road, you know, the rules of the road, the traffic lights and everything else. And lots of people said, well, there'll obviously be death and mayhem on the road if you do that. So you've got pedestrians and buses and cars and cyclists and everybody else all sharing a common space. Well, there wasn't death and mayhem on the road because what they'd done is take away the rules and make people think up into this sort of domain. So I have to take more accountability if I'm not just bound by a bunch of rules. And my goodness, that's one of the worlds that we've created in the world of work. We write lots of rules, and then we disassociate, therefore, the decisions that people make, and whether those decisions are the right decisions, because I'm simply pay playing by a set of rules. Or in many cases, not just playing by the rules, but trying actively to work around the rules. And we even write books called First Break All the Rules, right? So, and then it links to that idea of empowerment and trust. If we really want to engage the workforce, and we really want to get the best out of them, we've got to empower them, and we've used that word for years. Do you think that by writing all these rules and policies, what does that say? What it says is fundamentally, I don't trust you. So we're expecting trust to go this way, which my goodness, it needs to. But we, uh, but we need a lot more trust coming that way as well. That leaders and managers trust their people. It's not just about putting people into a box and saying, I don't trust you to do anything else. This is what I'm telling you. Just do your damn job and shut up. Okay, so very important constructs. And this links to this idea of where does HR need to go on this stuff? And I love this Dilbert cartoon, <clears throat> so you can read it. You're not allowed to have internal phone lists on your wall, so that's the manager with Dilbert. And then it says, there are excellent reasons for this policy, and I'd hope someday to know what they are. And then there's Catbert, the evil HR director. So they found out about our random policy generator. <laughs> now, that is how a lot of managers, if we're honest, feel in the business. I mean, in, my, you know, in the CIPD, I'm, I'm steadily unpicking policies, which make no sense. I've said, we've got to have a bonfire of the policies. We have got to trust the organization more, and we got to, and I think this is where a lot of the innovation is happening in HR now. People are letting go of some of this stuff. You probably read about the story of Netflix, did you? Or Virgin Group, where they said, I'm going to get rid of one of the sacred cows of HR, which is holiday policy. Don't we love monitoring that? Um, and they said, get, get rid of it. Now, you know, the apocryphal story is that I think in Virgin Group, that affected precisely 170 people. But hey, they started it, right? And, and who do you think looks after the holiday allowance if HR's not looking after it? Your peers, right? And actually, all the evidence suggests, as it does in many other examples, that if you give people the trust and responsibility for things like that, they take less time off, not more, because they're more concerned about, oh, my goodness, I've got to take responsibility for these other people. And if I'm off every other third week on holiday, I'm letting my team down. So this is very profoundly important to real innovation in HR, but it's got to be embedded in the things I described. This is not a free-for-all, it's not about anarchy, and it's not that we don't have any rules, but I love that Albert Camus um, quote, integrity has no need of rules. And I'm using that quote at the moment with the bankers, because I think it's very important, because we talk about values that say integrity. So, there's all of that. So then to summarize and sum up, a few quick thoughts. So the first is, is this is a lot of stuff going on here, right? A lot of stuff. And, and we've often agonized about being more strategic or whatever. Well, the first thing is, of course, we've got to understand the business strategy. What is the business trying to accomplish? And then behind that, say, all right, well, given all of these contextual things going on, given what the business is trying to accomplish, what is the workforce of the future? Where am I going to get the talent and skills from? How do I build the right organization and operating model to support and sustain the business strategy, and indeed sometimes inform the business strategy, because the business strategy may not be, a, 
you know, achievable when we start to look at these things? How is the culture supporting it and all those other things? That is the strategic agenda. And I cannot believe that any business will be successful from now and into the future unless it understands these things at that kind of strategic level. And let's not confuse that, whether you call it people strategy or anything else, with HR strategy, because HR strategy is just about what we do in HR. How do we make it better? How do we make it more effective and all those things? And as I said, there's a lot we need to think about in HR for sure, but it's got to be driven by that clear connect to the business strategy. And then to <coughs> kind of wrap up all of my thoughts into some hopefully meaningful framework, and I've rattled through a lot of ideas, but I think it's connecting to other themes you're hearing at this conference, is we're using this kind of framework just to help to bring it together. So the first is insights on this changing context. What is changing in the world of work the workforce and the workplace. This is our professional context. And I would say, if we don't understand this HR, I don't know who's going to understand this stuff. Is it going to be the finance teams or the marketing teams? I don't know. This is our stuff. And it is profoundly affecting every organization. And that also gives you the strategic platform to debate a lot of this stuff. We need to educate business leaders on what's really going on with all these shifts. And, and to, so for business leaders to move beyond the idea that you know, what's the problem with Gen Y? Why can't they just suck it up? Or whatever their particular worldview is, which is sometimes I've heard those kinds of worldviews. And then the analytic stuff, the science of human and organizational behavior I've described, and then, of course, what that all means for HR and learning. Okay? Um, and then final slide is this, which it then says, okay, I profoundly believe we have not done enough to educate and train and upskill ourselves as a profession. I profoundly believe that. We've been the cobbler's children. We've spent too much time worrying about everybody else. We've been very squeezed over the recent years, particularly on efficiency agendas, and every organization's downsize has also reduced the size of HR. We've been focused on things like process and, as I said, cost efficiency. We need to build a stronger profession. And that says that we understand what the professional future is going to need, the kind of capabilities, and that's, that's the program we're calling it. We have stronger standards that define the work that we do do, and I touched on that a bit. But we look at all the policy and regulation stuff, we've got to influence that as well, because that is really important to our world. And then these final two, but particularly the professionalization one. We need to think of ourselves more as a profession. Uh, and I have had too many conversations with people over the years in HR, and I say, tell me about your career in HR, and they say, well, I ended up in HR, ended up, didn't make an active choice, because I don't like numbers, and I don't like technology, but I like people. Well, okay, that's probably not a bad start, but we've got to understand technology, we've got to understand numbers, as I said. This is about being a business function, it's about being professional. And it also means, therefore, that we take CPD, continuous professional development learning, really seriously. And I think this is the time for us to stand up with more confidence as a profession. This is our time, given all the things we're talking about, where we can make so much impact, not just on individuals, which is vital, and the organizations that they work in, but on fundamentally economies, which is why I start with things like productivity, and society at large. Because none of the things I talked about are dissociated between the world of work and the world of not work. They're all connected. And what we haven't understood enough is some of those connections. So that's why it's so profoundly exciting to be in the profession. But I think these sorts of things, taking ourselves more seriously, having the confidence to know we're backed up with professional skills, CPD, all these other things, it's exactly what finance do and what gives them some of their credibility. And we need to do more of that ourselves. So uh, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much. Katie, I know you've got some questions. Thank you. We've got a couple of questions for you. What's the most radical change you think HR will experience in the near future? I, I think the most radical change is going to be some of the things I talked about, probably particularly this, this being brought much more into the C-suite. I'm experiencing a very different type of dialogue with the business leadership now and understanding these things. But I think, as I said, we have got to be prepared to drop some of the things we've been doing and focus on some of the things that I described. But how are you going to get people to do this? You know, we talked about earlier, we talked about with, with, with Alan, that, you know, if... If you're not engaging the senior leadership, um, you know, it, it, you might as well not bother. Yeah, you know? so it, and it's like two ends of a telescope, right? Because so senior business leaders, which is why I use that slide so people are our most important assets. How long have we heard that rhetoric from senior business leaders? And how often do we believe they understood anything but in that phrase at all? And so that there is some movement from that direction. We need to recognize that part of our role is to educate business leaders why this is important. And certainly from us as the CFD, it's all the way back into business schools. Why don't we teach this stuff at business schools? Why is this not on the business leaders' agenda everywhere? 
And then for us, we've got to do this kind of stuff. We've got to be able to come with more insight, data-driven insight, because that is what typically business leaders want to understand. Well, it so shows that people, that. We, are, we are using data to inform some people-related decisions. Almost 60% almost of people say that. What other questions do we have here? I'm just conscious of time, um, Peter. Um, technology becoming more powerful than the human brain, what does that mean for HR? <laughs> oh, I love that one. Um, <laughs> you see, so you know the Turing test, don't you? The Turing test? So Alan Turing had this test that he said, at some point in time, we will not be able to distinguish a computer from a human mind, and that you can do it by answering, asking lots of questions. IBM's latest venture on that is called Watson, named after Thomas Watson. And at that computer apparently has been passing the Turing test. So that it is able to fool a human being as to who is answering questions, the computer or the, or the, or the person. Now, what does that all mean? Well, it's back to the point I made before, and I've often heard this from people saying, oh, God, isn't technology going to take over our jobs and do this, do that, do the other? And I say, well, and if we let them, if we think the entire world is only going to be driven by clever people with pointy heads designing very clever systems, then we've got the wrong agenda. We need to work with them. We've got to make sure, and I think profoundly for our profession, this is important, that we have a responsibility to ensure that we're building meaningful work and that the human machine interaction is making the best use of the human. And it's not just about the optimization of technology. So that's the point. And yes, I think that's why you start to see, there's a great survey, I saw from Oxford Academics, that estimated in the next 10 years that 60% of jobs could be automated. And they started with jobs like being an actuary. Anybody in insurance here? Or, or auditors. Mm. Things like that, high skill jobs. Said, well, you just said a lot of jobs that, you know, jobs that we're training people to do actually don't exist. Yeah, right? so, we got so, to, so we got to be able to upskill and reskill, but I think, and that's a profoundly important agenda for HR as well, of course. But I really do believe our, one of our bigger purposes here as a profession is to ensure we're creating meaningful work. If we're not creating meaningful work, how are people going to be engaged? Why would they ever want to work for us? And how could we ever say that we're getting the best out of people? It's up to us, it's not just up to the pointy heads. Okay. I, I had you down as one of the pointy heads. I am, I'm, I'm a closet pointy head. <laughs> okay. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay. Yeah. You should go, go and speak to Kirsty. Yes. Um, Peter Chief, thank you very much. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Thank you.